Welcome to Adeptus On Air, the show where we examine how individuals and companies make decisions that drive their business and personal success. Each week, we connect with notable professionals who pull back the curtain on the industries that Adeptus has been on the cutting edge of for the last 30 years, including music, sports, and entertainment, as well as new emerging markets. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Adeptus on Air. I'm your host, Mike Hoffman, and this week I am joined by Titus Walker. Titus, how you doing, bud? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Titus is the owner of the Ultimate End Gamers League, uh, UEL, as you can kind of see by the logo uh, behind where he's sitting. Uh, this stuff's fascinating to me because, you know, growing up as a kid, I had my Atari and then my, you know, Nintendos and Playstations. Never thought that people can make a career out of this. Yeah. So kind of talk to me the impetus of, you know, growing up, I'm guessing, obviously, you were a video game fan and how it turned into a career for you. Sure. Um, yeah, when I when I was a kid, um, my dad um, introduced me to the world of, of video games. Um, it started with uh, Mortal Kombat was actually one that I was when I was a young, probably too young to be playing it. Um, I started with that. And, um, and, it, and I just kind of fell in love with it as a kid. It was something that you could kind of do to, you know, escape, but also have that that form of like competition. Um, I think that a lot of people get that that like you know competition flowing from whether it be sports or you know academics or there's a lot of different things business um but i found it in video games and so that's kind of where it started um competed a lot with my dad and and my siblings grew up in a big family and and so um yeah that was that was pretty much the 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 start of the love for me now was there was that like the main thing you had like were you not a sports fan did you not participate in sports where it was really yeah, no, it's it's crazy. I was extremely athletic, um, but I didn't enjoy it. Uh, so it was like I had the the talent, um, but I really didn't enjoy um, like I played football, um, did that really well. I was m really good at basketball as well, um, but I, I just didn't enjoy it. I didn't think that, you know, it was as much fun as I had when I sat down and, and played the video game. You know, that that for me was really, you know, get, it really got me my juices flowing and got me, you know, going to where I felt like, you know, I was, I was doing something that I loved. Um, though a lot, you know, you get pu pushed into the sports world, uh, because mm -hmm. you, especially, especially if you're good at it, you know, if you're talented, um, mm -hmm. that that's where people seem to want to push you. But, uh, I felt more love and more joy and enjoyment just coming from, from video games. Yeah. Well, cause you know, I'm, I'm sure it was the same in your house with your parents. It was, it's a nice day, go outside and play. Yep. It's not don't sit in front of the TV all day or watch TV or play video games. So the mindset of most people is, well, you're sitting, you're a couch potato, yeah. that kind of thing. So you were yeah. able to shake that. So how did it come from a passion as a kid to a career now? Well, um, so as as a kid, you know, like I said, my dad was into it. He, he bought video games um, quite often for us. But when I was really young, um, he actually was um, in prison for something that he, he didn't do. Um, but, you know, he was a, a young uh, black male and, and um, you know, kind of got pushed through the system and, and put into okay. um, prison and, and spent a good um, around five years, but was kind of in and out after. He's never really the same. Um, and so, um, I was, I kind of transitioned where, you know, my mom became the, uh, the breadwinner, the only, uh, parent in the household and she still supported the dream, but she didn't quite understand it. Um, she, as much as, you know, as much as he, he understood video games, she, she definitely didn't, but she still supported us quite a bit. And, um, but the people around her were all that, that typical, you know, um, oh, you know, they're rotting their brains and, you know, you, sh you shouldn't allow this and, and stuff like that. And so I think there there was that influence of hearing that all the time and, and not really believing it, not really falling for that um, that immediate response to video games because uh, it was something new and it was something that was exciting for the people that accepted it and the people that didn't, you know, just fell behind, just like with anything in, in history. Um, and so when I got older, um, I 
went immediately kind of into a uh, the business world, did real estate, and um, but never really stepped away from my love of video games. I was an extremely driven individual, which is why I was good at you know sports. Anything I I do, I I, I do at a hundred percent. And so, um, being that driven individual, I decided, all right, I'm gonna do this real estate thing. You know, take care of my family. Um, I'm a family man first, so. Um, decided to to start doing the the real estate. Did really well in that. Made a lot of money. Um, and uh, was kind of just got brought right back to the feeling of like not feeling like what I was doing was right. Not feeling, mm-hmm. you know, feeling kind of empty inside. Um, and feeling like there was still something really missing from my life. And so, um, I you know one day just kind of we we went out and bought a a, a virtual reality system. And um, and while I was like playing on the system. My wife was just like, you know, you should do a business out of this. Like you, you, you know, because I'm, you know, playing video games and, and really enjoying it. She was like, you should just make a business out of it. And I was like, huh? Like I, I like it didn't, it didn't really click, you know? <laughs> Until she said that. And I, and I just kind of like, you know, thought for like a couple of days, really um, started putting together business plans again with that business background. Um, I started, kind of feeling like oh okay well maybe um and I, i'm sorry my son is is in the in the background if you ever hear, hear any, any I, I heard that's okay how yeah. old is your yeah. son my son is three he just turned three uh and he comes awesome. everywhere with me so yeah that's okay but uh um, good uh, but yeah so he's over there playing mario odyssey um but anyways uh <laughs> he'll be running your business in 20 years exactly exactly hey hey stop all that all right so anyways um so when that you know, when I started um, thinking about it, I realized, you know, the business plan in order for this company, or a company that I decide to create to be successful, it really would have to have something that would draw me out of my basement or draw me out of my game room. Because now we're at the point where you have everything around you at home, you know, you don't have to back in the day that arcade environment was like, Mm -hmm something that drew you in, you know, and Mm -hmm. because it was like, you couldn't be social outside of that, you couldn't interact with people that had the same likes and, and desires as you outside of that, right? Well, in today's world, you can very much so in your basement, you can still be able, you can be on a discord video call while, you know, playing the video game. And, you know, so I was like, there has to be something else outside of gaming, right? And so, we have we had a lot of arcades that were kind of popping up around us. And I was like, the, the one thing that I'm seeing that that is a big issue is um, is there there they don't have anything that's going to really draw me in. That's going to really make me want to be there. Right. And so I started looking into competitive, the competitive gaming side, because mm-hmm. I was like, if someone felt like you, the one thing that that exists, but doesn't really exist in that world is a true competitive environment like the one that I experienced in sports, right? And so I could kind of bring it back to that. That mm-hmm. environment of competition sure. doesn't exist. It, it does and it doesn't. And I'll explain in a second. But um, so I started thinking about, okay, what other... Um, I started looking at esports and and thinking, okay, what could I do that, that really takes away from... Um, well, that doesn't take away, but that really enhances the way esports is now. Because if you know anything about esports, you know that every single esport is the exact same format. Essentially, you have a game and you play that game and you have a competition in whatever that game is. And that is the esport, right? The problem with that is if you think about it, like, can could anything really be called a sport? If it changes at its core every single year or every six months or, you know, because at the end of the day, the person that was the best at this game will most likely not be the best at the next one or the next one or the next one. Right. So I I looked at it and said, okay, well, that that's not really a sport. That's kind of just like you're sitting down and and playing a video game for, you Mm -hmm. know, 100 hours. And then, yeah, you're good at it. Yeah, Congratulations. You know what I mean? Like, duh. Um, so I started looking deeper into it and thinking, okay, well, what if we created our own sport out of th- what currently exists? Um, then I researched all the sports. I researched, uh, NBA and how it was created, how it was formed. 
I researched um, the NFL. I researched UFC. And I started seeing similarities in that before there was NBA, there was a basketball, right? Basketball existed prior to the NBA. So similar to how gaming exists now, before there's an actual sport of gaming, you know, because if you think Mm -hmm. basketball, you think NBA, that's just like, you know, how it is, right? If you think football, you think NFL, right? And we're kind of getting to the the, the point now because I, I watched UFC growing up. And so uh, we're getting to the point where if you think fighting, you think UFC, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if you think gaming, what do you think? Everybody thinks something different, right? Like there is no um, consistent thought process of what gaming means or what an esport is. And mm-hmm. so... The more I started to dive into that, I realized, well, another big issue is that if I don't, if I create a Madden community, let's just say, right, Madden, Mm -hmm. uh, the NFL game, I build a community around it. I have 100 million people in my community. The second that Madden decides, hey, buddy, um, I I love the community. I love what what you've built, but you're no longer allowed to play Madden because we want that. We want, we want that. We want to do what you're doing. We want a piece, right? Or we want our own. Yeah. Yeah. They can do that. Right. And so it became like this aha moment for me of like, oh, okay, well, basically what these companies are doing is like building a mansion on someone else's land. You know, Mm -hmm. if you don't own the land, it's not your, it's your mansion. Sure. (laughs) But you got to get it out of here. And how do you do that? Right. You can't just pick up and move a mansion. It's right. a lot that's required to be able to do that, right? It's the same with gaming. If you build a community in someone else's house or on someone else's land, you know, then that person at any point can say, oh, yeah, we can do that. And they can probably mm-hmm. do it better than you. No matter mm-hmm. how good you are, they can probably do it better. Mm-hmm. So we built a sport instead and said, we're going to take 33. We're, we're not even going to focus on a game at all. When you say, what game do we play? That's a trick question. We actually play 33 different games and we focus on genres. So it's really what genre do you play? Oh, well, we play fighting games, shooting games, sports games, racing games and um, strategy games. And we play them all at once. So you have to be good at all of the genres in order to be considered a gamer. And we call them an end gamer, as you can see here. And that was my next question. So the way the way this works is I just can't be a. I'm a big sports guy, and I, and I had a lot of friends growing up, and I wasn't really into the video games as much as them. But they were sports fans, so they loved Madden or you know the NBA, whatever they were called back in the day. Yep. But now it's not just that; they also have to be able to like the Mortal Kombat's of the world. Or yep. So if you're not a if you're not a full fledged uh, across the board, well rounded, I'll use the phrase gamer, you're not going to succeed in your league. Exactly, and and think about it like this, right? what at its core what is fighting it's it's an art form right what is basketball it's an art form it's all a form of expression or a form of art right gaming is another form of expression or another form of art but Mm -hmm. until it's it's um until it's given a platform that shows the mastery of that art i i don't believe that it will it will blossom the way that it should i don't believe that it will become this you know huge it's already you know a billion dollar industry but mm-hmm. i don't I, you know the hundred billion and the you know all of that will not be seen until somebody comes in and says exactly what i'm saying we have to master the art form as a whole you know because you boxing doesn't need ufc and ufc doesn't need boxing Mm-hmm. wrestling doesn't need ufc none of those all of those things existed on their own before there was a ufc right mm-hmm. but ufc combined all of those things and said no we're, you have to master fighting right i'm doing the same thing you have to master gaming at its core to become an end gamer a master of gaming so to get to my one question i have to ask you a different question first so sure how do your how do you become a league member? Is it just, I'm interested, I sign up? Is it a tryout? Is it you recruiting people? Or can I just say to you now, I want to be in your league and I fill out a form and I'm in your league? That's a great question. So um, so we've the way to join the league now, we have um, four hub locations and we're going to continue to expand. But there's four locations where you can compete at. They run tournaments. It's about $20 to enter. If you win that tournament, then you get points and you get put on a leaderboard. 
And as you wake, make your way to the top of the leaderboard, once you reach a certain amount of points, a certain amount of wins, then you get access into our draft. And our draft happens every season. We're on season seven now. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're competing for $100,000 this season. So once you get access to the draft, now you get picked up by a team, possibly. Like the Gorillas, this is one of the teams I'm just representing. I don't, I'm not mm-hmm. a part of them or whatever. But mm-hmm. uh, it's one of the teams that's owned by um, one of our investors in the league. So, um, So once you get drafted, if you get drafted by a team, then you now compete on that team and fill a gap, right? Some sometimes some teams are looking for shooters. Some teams just like a you know some teams are looking for a point guard or a shooting guard, right? Some teams are looking for shooters. Some teams are looking for racers, sh- um, fighting game players. Um, some teams are just looking for role players and gamers, people that really understand gaming at its core and can pick up a game and, and really master it very quickly, or at least become you know, average or above average at that game. So kind of, which is kind of leading to my second question. So in theory, once I qualify and I get drafted, I don't have to be really an expert potentially across the board of those five genres. I might be the guy that, you know, I'm the best shooter out there. So I can be on this team and just compete in the shooting games. Yep. But I don't know a lick about sports. Yep. And so that, that, that kind of, goes into where essentially everybody that joins the league in the beginning normally has a genre that they've mastered, but the coaches and the trainers have learned the art of, of really like seeing a game and then understanding where it translates amongst other Mm -hmm. games. Right. And so they're an end gamer in, in teaching. Right. And so what they do is you can really say, okay, well, you're good at this fighting game. Okay. This fighting game has, um, the, the things that you need in order to understand it is is button recognition, um, uh, button mapping, uh, pattern recognitions, and uh, understanding what your opponent's movements are going to be. Mm-hmm. There are some shooting games that have a lot of that same criteria. And we've broken every, you know, each genre down to those criteria so that, you know, OK, this translates into this game pretty easily. And we can each we can actually teach this game very easily and kind of expand on what they already know. Um and and the players that are that that adopted and are are accepting of it normally are the the some of the top players in the league, top paid players too. So how do you pick which game? So so let's just say I'm on a team, I'm on the Gorillas, and I'm competing against whoever I'm competing against. What games are they going? You you have five genres you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're like, let's talk about the sports that. genre. Like yeah. is it a random game each week of competition where this week could be football, next week could be basketball, or is it this season it's going to be X? Yeah, yeah. So you're asking all the money questions, and I love it. So, um, so if you, so essentially, you have you have 33 different titles across mm-hmm. all of these genres, right? Each season, we do a big announcement of the new wheel. So it's a, it's actually a roulette wheel that we put it on, um, mm-hmm. and uh, and that gives that excitement of like, oh, what game's coming next? Because every game is only worth one point, and then it spins mm-hmm. again, and now you play again, whatever that game is. So, um, so essentially, you know the 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 games themselves become irrelevant so now if you know tekken doesn't want to play ball with us and says no you can't play my game okay cool we'll play you know some other indie developed game that's similar to tekken doesn't really matter to us there's millions and millions Mm -hmm. of games right now that we can play um and so the way we determine it is one um how likely is this uh this game to to play ball with us to to actually be you know license the game to us for this season um, and it's for the whole season. So we determine the games um, and then we determine based on um, also. So now that we've built this community, it is OK, well, you want to have your game on our wheel. We're going to now advertise this to three, four hundred thousand people um, mm-hmm. in a season. This game is it's a form of advertisement for your game. So in order mm-hmm. to have your game on the wheel, I want X amount of dollars. Right. And so now these smaller companies that are trying to, to show competition within their game get access to this large community of gamers that are playing every mm-hmm. day, that are practicing every day, that will buy the game pretty much guaranteed um, because mm-hmm. they have to in order to, to be able to compete in it. And so mm-hmm. um, so essentially each game on the wheel is almost like an advertising spot. Right. For the for the developers themselves, which takes the power from the developer and gives it right back to the gamer. If you don't create a game that works for us then we will not play your game. Sure. So that's one revenue stream for you, the, the people paying for the rights to be promoted in your yep. group. 
Yep. Another revenue stream is the $20 entry fees. Yep. So what other ways does your business bring in revenue? Uh, merchandise, mm-hmm. advertising, um, the uh, sponsorships. So uh, we actually do each team is, is owned by an investor. And so we expanded and just did four new teams, four new expansion teams. So it's a total of 12 teams. And each one uh, is owned by somebody that bought that team. So that's another revenue stream. Um, we have um, four teams for sale right now. One will sell for 100000 most likely today. Um, and then we'll uh, kind of up that from there once we, depending on, you know, where we, where we go from there. Um, and then let's see, we have, um, so we do it like a collegiate push. Um, mm-hmm. And so we're kind of becoming the NCAA at the same time as the, mm-hmm. the NBA, right? Um, and so yeah. um, why not tackle them both? And so that's another kind of revenue stream. We, we come in, we license what we do to the, to the uh, college and it just makes it much easier for them to, to organize an esports platform because mm-hmm. rather than them saying, we got to find seven p- people that play Overwatch and then a coach and a trainer and all that mm-hmm. just for this one game they can include their entire college in any games that they play, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever games. And then now everyone can be included in whatever this esports program is that they're doing. And the more colleges we get involved in that, the easier it is for a college to do esports, right? So so you win the league. You, that, that team gets a $100,000 prize pool to share among all the yep. teammates. Yep. I own a team. Yep. How do me as an owner reap the benefits and get my money back? Like in yep. the NFL – the owner gets a share of revenue from TV, from yep. advertising, from, you know, revenue, ticket sales, all that kind of stuff. So as part of your revenue that you're generating, is some of it going back to the actual owners themselves besides potentially winning? Yes. And so so they have they have multiple different ways of doing it. Um, of course, they have their own merchandising. Um, their, their players also stream. They when they win that prize pool, the team owner gets a thirty five percent cut. Well, it depends on thirty five percent is like the the minimum, but that team owner mm-hmm. that's, decides before the season starts what percentage he's paying his players, and so they mm-hmm. all agree under contract to a certain percentage for the year. Um, so they receive it from that as well, and then um, and then of course like uh, merchandising, uh, jersey sales, um, uh, sponsorships, and stuff like that. So does a a player on a team only get money if they win? Yes, uh, for the most part, unless they find sponsors for themselves, you know, right. or endorsements for themselves. As of now, yeah, it would be if they win. Um, you know, they 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 get a prize pool. We've kind of changed it up. We're on season seven, so we've done mm-hmm. different you know tactics. And I think one of the best that we've done that we'll probably go back to is every game because they play ten games in a season and then they go into the playoffs based on where they're seated, right? And so um, so we've we found that last season when we did, essentially we had a, a payment for every time you won a game, period. It seems like that probably worked the best. So we'll probably end up going back to that, but um, I didn't say that out loud. I'll just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when we'll you see. say a game, you mean a game where the gorillas are going against another team. So one game yeah. is really several games in a game. Yes. Yep. So one game is normally around, on average, around 20 games. Right. So you'll play 20 different titles in that one uh, matchup. And we can decide, okay, I'm going to play this game representing our team. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do the sport game. You're going to do the shooting game. No. Uh, so so the game is is like, I always say 60% coaching, but some people say 80 <laughs> So the way it works, um, similar to a baseball rotation, let's say I have seven players on my team. Uh-huh. I wish I could share my screen right now to show you. But anyways, it's you have, you have um, seven players on a team. And and if um, you play, let's say the wheel spins and it's Tekken, right? So you send in your best Tekken player and they happen to be your best fighter, period. If the wheel spins again and it's another fighter, you can't play that player until everyone else has played. Gotcha. And so you're taking a risk. If your team doesn't understand the games as a team and, and, and practice the games as a team, you're taking a risk in just having specialists in every category. Most right, because I could be left with a shooting game for myself and I don't ever do shooting games. Probably one of the most entertaining things you'll ever see is two players that do not play those games having to compete for big money. <laughs> like it is because it's so it's it's so you know exciting and like you everybody knows they don't play and everybody's just amped up no matter who wins because they're like, you know, 
But then again, every now, every now and then you get surprised by somebody that never knew that game the whole season. And then all mm-hmm. of a sudden they just went, uh, you know, went and practiced it like crazy end up in that situation, right time, right place, playing against somebody that doesn't know how to play, and they just absolutely de- destroy them. So what's your vision for this? You're in year seven now. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you want this to go to year 10, year 15, year 20. But you seem like the kind of guy that you're not just thinking short term. You're also looking years ahead. Oh, yeah. So what are you envisioning if everything comes together the way you want it? Let's just go ahead five, 10 years. Where would you like to see this in year 15? Oh, man. Year 15, um, we'll, we'll have – uh, 52 teams in, well, probably not 52 yet, but we'll be at like 40 teams mm-hmm. in the U S we don't want to expand too quickly just cause it's, it's a big revenue stream for us. So it doesn't really make sense for us to rush and, and get a team mm-hmm. in every, every, every state. Yep. Um, but then we'll also have a, like a G league, a city team where they'll basically qualify at a local level at your local, you know, um, your local Dave and Busters or your local, whatever they do the competitions there. And then once they reach a certain point, they can get entered into the draft or the G League based on their skill level, Mm -hmm. show their skills in the G League, possibly be picked up at the state level. And then you'll have different um, you'll have different states in other countries as well that have their teams. And so once all the states compete on their own level, they go to more of like an Olympic um, style one where now everyone is competing against each other. Different countries are competing at that level. the players will be paid much more than any you, you, you could combine NBA, NHL, NFL um, uh, and MLB probably. And still they'd be uh, higher paid than that. Um, so that that would be that would be one of my goals as well. Essentially, you know, there's two I believe it's two to three hundred million uh, basketball players or football players in the world and and. 400 million basketball players in the world. There's a 3.3 gamers in the world, 3.3 billion gamers in the world. So you do the math on that. Like you could combine basketball, football, NHL, as far as viewership, there are more gamers in the world than there are of that. And so Mm -hmm. eventually it reaches that tipping point where, you know, they, they, people will be leaving the NBA and NFL to come join this because it's safer. You know, it's, it's, it's better. It's, 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 it's better for your body, for your, your bones and all that stuff like that. Um, yeah, but you get blisters on your fingers sometimes, don't you? Right. Yeah, that's that's the most <laughs> yeah, strained wrist, maybe. You know, from pressing the button too fast. <laughs> Otherwise, you're good. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, um, I would say in in three years, I would say we are going to be at a a a huge tipping point. Um, probably probably well before then, just because we are we are already kind of seeing this huge influx where. Um, we're starting to get we're getting a huge influx of female gamers. And you know that that brings in a lot of uh, a lot of the male gamers as well, um, getting mm-hmm. a huge influx of um, attention, uh, like just a ton of it um, at this point to where uh, we have gamers. I mean, we have people that are buying teams that are have huge celebrity around them. Um, and so I'm in talks with quite a few different people um, that, yeah, I mean, it, it's only a matter of time at this point. Um, before before we get there, we're working with Oklahoma University to build out a big uh, esports arena platform. Well, the, uh, the, you just led me to my next. I have two more questions, but you just led me to my next one. Saying, thinking, all right, the NFL, the NBA, all these sports use college. Let's face it, as a minor leagues, and that's what yeah. college sports has become. Yep. You know, for the really good ones, they go on. The other people hopefully get a degree and, and can do other things. Yep. I know a lot of colleges have esport. Clubs, let's go on clubs yeah. where the people just get together. I did some college tours with my daughter last year, and some of the schools have these awesome gaming centers. I mean, they look yep. really, really cool. Yep. But I don't believe there's competitive on the college level teams like in your league. Yep. Is that something you think will evolve either through you or just through the natural progression of life where you'll see a college tournament of games? Yeah, we, we actually are setting one up now with um, 20 different HBCUs, um, setting up a collegiate McDonald's All-American game, basically, yeah. for esports. So absolutely. Um, absolutely. I, I think that that's where it's headed. Um, the reason that they're clubs right now is mm-hmm. because a lot of these colleges can't get the required um, – they can't get the required like business structure in order to make it make sense for them to run anything else. And so there's all these different collegiate esports leagues, but they really all do the same thing. Um, they play Overwatch, they play Rocket League, they play Fortnite sometimes, or you know. And so, um, but again, that excludes a a large 
majority of the college and they're they're the players in the college mm-hmm. and so what you're doing is essentially you're you're opening up the doors to give them something but it really is just like a a, a pebble in comparison to what you know I, what I believe the the gamer wants, you know, the gamer wants access to a lot more than just Fortnite and Rocket League. You know, there are a ton of people yeah. that play it, um, but, you know, there aren't a ton of people that want to play it like they play it. Right. Right. And so um, and so I think we can reach a much larger audience um, in that college and get a lot more participation in that college um and leave a lot a lot more uh, give give people a lot more joy and enjoyment out of the competition as well for the for the casual gamer that just loves the average gamer plays 24 games a year so you know playing one game doesn't make sense it just doesn't it's 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 the old school we got we and i i'm gonna make that i'm gonna make sure it's that way it's gonna be an old old school thought and you mentioned the celebrity angle before getting celebrities involved obviously just builds your brand yeah. It reminds me of what was going on the past couple of weeks in soccer. I don't know if you saw this. Mm-hmm. There was a 7v7 soccer tournament Yep, with like a million dollar purse. But mm-hmm. each team was kind of either owned or managed by a celebrity. Yep. And they kind of brought in, they had qualifiers and they got a TV deal to watch it and, 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 and with a prize. But no one would, I think, generally care about a seven on seven soccer tournament. Right. Except for the fact that, okay, these teams have celebrity status behind them. Yeah, it's a it's a big like um, one of my mentors calls it the smoke and mirrors effect, where essentially mm-hmm. you're you're um, bringing in them to just bring the eyeballs in. Yeah. You know, um, it's for us, it's it's a little different because I, I do see this as, um, you know, all of our teams are known by celebrities. We have business owners. Um, mm-hmm. We have um, military personnel. We have real estate um, investors. We have quite a bit um, that own own in the league. But. I do see ours as more of a long term think like the first NFL team sold for twenty five dollars. So like, you know, that's how I see it. Like no matter what we sell it for, it's a steal that, you know, because eventually when we reach the status that we're headed towards, um, you know, this will be a, an investment into a business that you will manage and, and it'll become your your mainstream, no matter who the celebrity is, you know? Right. And so we don't just let anybody purchase a team. You know, they we, they actually go through a process of like, right. we make sure they understand the vision. We make sure that they understand, you know, they, they represent the brand and what we do. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we don't want to be stuck in the situation where, you know, the NFL is where, you know, a lot of the team owners end up, you end up finding all kinds of, you know, madness about them. Of course it can mm-hmm. still happen, but our goal is to avoid that. Right. So you're doing your due diligence and you're doing all your backgrounds and all that kind yep. of stuff. Yep. Yeah. It's funny. Cause again, I'm, I'm a little older than you. So when, when, when I went back to thinking video games, you know, my, my big thing was going into like a restaurant and seeing like a Miss Pac-Man machine in the front, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I, and you put my quarter in and playing it. You, you never thought about it from competitive yeah and the first time you ever thought about competitive was maybe you were playing a sports game at home and you had a second joystick yeah. and you know someone will be playing a little football game with you with little robot football people running around the field so yeah it's amazing to see how this has become like a whole different thing not only yeah. from the competitive thing you're talking about but just from the graphics and the reality of it and you know like i said i remember when I played Atari and, and you were able to beat the computer in the high level of hockey, well, you mailed in a proof of it and you, they mailed you a patch. Yeah, yeah. You know, that was the coolest thing to get that patch, you know, but the hockey things, they were really little like dots. The, the people yeah. were like these little moving dots. And now you actually see facial expressions and these guys actually look like the real guys and they yep. have the same mannerisms and, and things like that. So I think it's really amazing, you know, how this is going to progress. Or any of you mentioned virtual reality before. Are any mm-hmm. of your games virtual reality or not yet? Not yet. So um it's something that I've really wanted to do, but I've found that like I think that there will be so, you know, long term, like you said before, I think there's gonna be a, a league that exists where their focus is, you know, forty and up. Gamers that are like forty and up. So they have like Atari, Pac Man, that's all on the wheel. And you you know, they're competing. Yeah, they're competing at that level, I mean, right? <laughs> exactly. So, so you, you can kind of see how this kind of yeah. can explode, right? You know, because something like that, where they're competing for big money, you know, these are people that were gamers growing up, but never yeah. really got a chance to compete at this level. Mm-hmm. Now they can, they can show their skills, you know. Um, and then um, I see another one where it's like kind of the rhythm style game, rock, rock band, 
you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, Dance Dance Revolution. DDR, or, yeah. yeah, yeah, those types of things. And so it'd be more like the the active style of gaming. So it's just a different wheel altogether mm-hmm. with different yeah. competitors. And so they're more like active gaming. Virtual reality would be included in that. Um, those Wii bowling, all, all of that type of stuff where um, that's a separate wheel. So now we have, you know, the the we have the the NBA, but then you also have um, I'm trying to think of another style. There, there's more styles of basketball, like slam ball and stuff like that. But I don't know right. how much you follow it. But but so it's just taking taking what we do and then expanding on it in different areas as well. So that's kind of that long term vision you were talking about earlier. That's pretty cool. And, and so you you you're the owner of the league. You're mm-hmm. the commissioner of the league. Yep. You're you're everything. So this so you're basically are you the only what I'll call employee running everything or do you have like a staff no. or yeah no and I'm definitely not everything um I'm like the person that that thought of it um me me and my wife came up with the the concept mm-hmm. um together but no we have um gosh we have probably about 60 or so people that that mm-hmm. um that operated at this point not wow. including all of the not including the other f- um the, the four locations the people that work wow. at those um, so yeah, we're, we have quite a bit and they're all just like really disciples of the league, if you will. Yeah. Um, and they are the lifeline of the league. I, this thing can go on without me in a way, like not really, but, but really sure. like they You're being modest. I appreciate that. No, no. I mean, they, they really <laughs> do make this thing yeah. special. You know, sure. I, you know, there was a time where I had to be at everything. So I know the difference, mm-hmm. right? Like there was a time yeah. when I did everything seasons one through four, pretty much. Um, I did everything from start mm-hmm. to finish from, but now like, you know, a lot of the rules and, and stuff like that are, are put together without, you know, without me, just, I'm just signing mm-hmm. off, you know, um, yeah. a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the, the gameplay and, you know, um, even like referees and selections and, and hiring that happens and stuff like that. I'm really just signing off at the end of the day now. So it's very different. Um, and it's definitely not all me. So <laughs> So give me information as we wrap this up, you know, in terms of how people can find you, get involved in that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, if you, you can uh, find us on uh, our website, uelesports.com, but um, on all socials, Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, um, TikTok, on, at UEL Esports. So just U-E-L Esports. Um, and then um, you can email us if you would like. You can email Olivia, my assistant, at info at uelesports.com. So everything's UEL Esports if you if you search that with the first thing that comes up. Um, but yeah, I mean, so you, you can contact us pretty easily. Um, Olivia is extremely responsive. So um, my son looks like he's going to make a guest appearance. All right, come on. Let's bring him on. I got some questions right. for him. All right. What games are you playing? T, what, ga- what games do you play? Now, what what game do you like the most? You like Mario? Hmm. Hmm. You want to say Super Mario? He's, he's shy. What's your name? Oh, now you're going to be shy. I hear you yeah, talking in the past half hour. Now you're going to be shy? Talk about Skeleton. What's your name? Titus Walker. Titus Walker? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know someone else named Titus Walker. He, he says, I'm not named Titus Walker. You know, oh, like, yeah. okay. You're the real Titus Walker, right? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, listen, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, yep. Looks like you got other stuff you got to take care of. Yep. But uh, listen, I appreciate everything. Good luck with the league. It's, it's exciting. I'm definitely going to check it out because I, you know, I like watching things that I'm not good at. So yeah. this, is, <laughs> this is actually a perfect fit for me. And you'll reach out to me when you get a Miss Pac-Man league going because I'm, uh, I'm ready to take over the world there. So. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much for having me on. I look forward to the episode. Yeah. Thanks so much. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Adeptus On Air. If you like this episode, please subscribe and leave a review. If you have a question related to this episode or have a request for what you would like to hear, please email us at marketing at adeptuscpas.com. You can also find us at adeptuscpas.com online or follow us at Adeptus on social media. The views and opinions by the podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Adeptus. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice.